Sonic is the fighting game of platformers. Now, what do I mean by that? Sonic very obviously doesn't fight in his games, and no, this doesn't count. So what exactly am I referring to? Alright, so fighting games are really weird as a genre. They're distinctive from other video game genres in that fighting games are considerably harder to get into as a casual than as a person who has a decent amount of experience in the field. Like, if you've ever played an RPG for the first time, let's say Pokemon, it's gonna be pretty easy to get into it. Despite you having little to no experience in the genre, it's a series that demands that you press buttons at whatever pace you want with not a ton of strategy, so it's fun for people just getting into it. With fighting games, this can be a little different. I remember when I played Street Fighter V for the first time, I did not like it very much. It felt very stiff to move around in, I didn't feel satisfied with any of the neutral wins I got, and I didn't really have an understanding of fighting game fundamentals, and so I didn't play the game for a decent amount of time. However, as I started to better understand the mechanics of the game and put a decent amount of practice into it, the game became considerably more fun to play. I mean, I'm still not good at the game, I just kind of master Zangief and hope the opponent holds block while I go for a Siberian Express and a connection they can't react in. But the game's way more fun now that I put at least some practice to actually learn it. What I'm getting at here is that fighting games are a genre that have a considerably higher skill floor than other games before they can start feeling really fun to play. However, when you do meet that skill floor, the game feels better than what it would have felt if you were just given a button that just maximizes the advantage of your neutral wins for you. Although it sacrifices the enjoyment of people who initially get into the genre, it's even more fun for people who choose to get better at the game. The only thing these games need to do after that is give the player a reason to keep practicing and learning the game despite it not feeling good initially. And different games do that in different ways. Some just have sick combos that people aspire to eventually do. Some have interesting neutral games that are enjoyable to look into. And some actually give players the tools to enjoy the game initially so they'll eventually be interested in getting better later. Now, you may be asking, what does this all have to do with Sonic the Hedgehog? And after thinking about it for a while, I've come to realize it's quite literally the same design philosophy, just executed in a completely different genre. When designing Sonic, Yuji Naka wanted to design a platformer that rewards consistently practicing and understanding the levels of the game through constant replays of the title with significant decreases in the time it takes to complete those levels, and the raw speed that you go at to complete those stages is the entertainment you get out of the genre. Speedrunning is the basis of your enjoyment for Sonic games, and the more time you put into playing the game rewards you with this higher form of enjoyment that you might not get out of something like Mega Man. However, the skill floor being tied directly to the entertainment of the game means that people initially getting into a Sonic title might not enjoy the struggle to eventually become fast, and would like to just go fast immediately. The way this design philosophy is described is exactly what I was referring to when talking about fighting games. The game can be difficult to get into initially, but with a better understanding and time put into practicing the game, the enjoyment of it is much greater than if the game just gave you the tools to play optimally from the beginning. However, the grind to get there can feel unfun at times, and there will be certain aspects of the game that will get someone to want to get to that level. And this playstyle that I'm talking about is executed to different degrees of success in every Sonic game so far. The classic games allowed you to move at breakneck pace if you understood the top route is usually going to be the fastest method of travel and your ability to get to the top route without getting stopped by obstacles is the enjoyment you get out of the game. Your ability to execute different techniques and precise jumps is rewarded with the ability to make Sonic go fast, which is where the enjoyment of the game comes from. This is also seen in the adventure games, where your understanding of how the spin dash works and your ability to properly execute techniques allows you to reach shortcuts that you wouldn't normally be able to reach if you didn't properly understand and practice the game. This also applies to the boost games, where your knowledge of shortcuts and your execution of getting to those shortcuts with good reactions to quick time events, precise jumps, and perfect quick stepping allows you to beat a level much faster than if you just picked up and played the game for the first time. And I understand that every game is like this, obviously you can speedrun any game you want, but Sonic is the most extreme franchise in this design philosophy with the highest emphasis of being insanely fast and decreasing your time. You don't see a franchise like Kirby giving you a D rank on its levels because you decided to take the level slow, because the game doesn't actively reward and punish you for taking time on its levels. Sonic does. And while all this talk about Sonic's design philosophy and how it's executed is neat, it does come with a price. As mentioned before, newer players who are getting into the game will have a significantly worse run since they don't have that understanding that experienced players do. In something like a fighting game, this means that their neutral will feel stiff and their ability to hold advantage and get out of disadvantage are very lacking, which can make the game feel insanely unfun. In a platformer like Sonic, however, where your goal to be fast causes you to lose more and more control of your character as your frames to react to obstacles decreases more and more the closer you get to the goal, you're either supposed to play the game slowly and deal with Sonic's bad movement when he's not immediately going at top speed with a spin dash or boost, or you're getting hit with every obstacle in the game because you can't respond fast enough to it with your very tiny reaction window at top speed. 
Most newer players end up picking the latter, and it's why a popular opinion I see among people who play Sonic games is that they promote the idea of going fast while putting hundreds of different obstacles in your way that stop you from doing that. And while I understand why it is an issue that you can't pick up a game and immediately be the fastest thing alive in every section, I don't think just giving the players the means to be super fast all the time would be very satisfying. The design philosophy behind Sonic isn't just to be fast as a product of merely existing, but rather to be fast as a reward for putting time into practicing the game. It's the same deal with fighting games. Nobody says fighting games are bad because they promote doing sick combos but makes it super hard to execute them, because putting practice into the games is something you need to do before you get into doing those kinds of combos. You're not going to pick up Sonic Generations and become the next Blue Mania the same way you're not going to pick up Street Fighter V and become the next Daigo. But still, fighting games do give you a reason to keep practicing and playing the game despite how bad it may feel at first. So does Sonic do the same thing? Yes. Yes it does. Likewise to how some people aspire to do the sick combos that have top fighting game players pull off, some people aspire to do the sick things that speedrunners do in Sonic games. I'll be honest, although I still liked Unleashed, I didn't want to practice the game as much until I saw the tech that speedrunners used to decrease their time in both the boost levels and warehog levels, and the emphasis on time in Sonic Unleashed made it more satisfying to pull off those kinds of techs in that game than in a different game with speedrunning tech like Super Mario 3D World. However, while these things are contributors to why someone will keep coming back to practice a Sonic game, I feel that the main thing driving people to keep practicing these games is actually this. This is Spectacle, the main way Sonic games keep people wanting to play them. Remember when I said that some fighting games give players the tools to enjoy the game initially so they'll eventually be interested in getting better later? This is that, but put into a platform, the Sonic equivalent to a Fighter Z auto combo. Spectacles in Sonic are a double-edged sword. On one hand, they're cool for casuals because it requires little to no effort to actually make Sonic go fast. It's a reward for the game handed to people who can't initially meet that reward, so even they're happy with the game. However, it also comes at the detriment of people who played the game multiple times over. You aren't going to be interested in the 30 second double boost sequence if you played through that same stage a thousand times over. You're only going to think it's sick the first or second time. Because of this, I feel that spectacles should be designed with at least some effort being put into how you complete it. Sure, it doesn't need to be a significant amount, or else spectacles would feel just as difficult as the rest of the game for beginners. However, it should be enough so that experienced players can at least be doing something while they wait for the 10 second cutscene to end. For example, I feel that the spectacle of the Orca in Sonic Adventure is badly designed because, while it is something that makes you feel fast without actually being good at the game, it's boring for experienced players since you don't actually do anything in that time span. However, I think that the spectacle of the boost is well designed because it's a way for casuals to feel like they're going fast, while also being a mechanic that veteran players use to access shortcuts in the game. It's not like you're just boosting on flat ground until you reach the goal, which is why I like the boost. Well, that brings me to my next point. I also feel like the ratio of spectacle to actual gameplay should be kept pretty even for every game. I think, for something like the boost games for example, there's a spectrum of level design from spectacle portions to actual gameplay, and each game is placed differently on that spectrum. The reason why I don't like Sonic Forces' modern gameplay is because, on that spectrum, Forces is wildly closer to just spectacles than every other game on it. Sure, some of this stuff is neat to watch the first time, but I wouldn't want to play the game again because I didn't do anything. I just watched what boils down to an in-game cutscene. The reason why Sonic Unleashed is my favorite modern Sonic game is because I feel that it's the closest to just raw gameplay of any of the Boost games, which I value significantly more in a Sonic game compared to Spectacle. Do casuals suffer because of this? Yes. However, I am not new to this game, so I'd like the game to have as much interaction with my own abilities as possible. The reason why I think Sonic Generations gets the most praise of any Boost game is because it's probably the most balanced of any Boost game in both gameplay and Spectacle, making it fun for casuals and fun for experienced players equally. But anyways, that's all I wanted to talk about in this video. I hope you all enjoyed watching, these are still fun to make, and I really want to make more of these more frequently. As always, you can like and subscribe to my channel to support me greatly. I know this is a common thing now, but apparently less than 5% of the people watching my content aren't even subscribed, so it would be nice if you did. We're closer than ever to a million subs, guys. I think this video will finally be the breaking point we need. You can also follow my Twitter, where I post my art decently frequently, or follow my Twitch, where I stream mainly fighting game content like Smash Ultimate. Finally, you can join the Discord to get updates about all of this, along with meeting great people I've met through my Twitch and YouTube. Thank you all for watching, and goodbye. Thank you.